Uh, good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones, tablets and other electronic devices. We have received apologies from Jackie Bailey, MSP. Um, our first item of business today is to decide whether to item three in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our next piece of business is to take evidence on the Community Justice Bill's financial memorandum from the Scottish Government Bill team. I therefore like to welcome to the committee Elaine Hamilton, Arlene Stewart and Andrew Bruce. Good morning to you all. And apologies for lateness. Uh, I'm afraid our previous guests were running very late and so we were half an hour late in starting off that session. Uh, members of copies of all written evidence received along with a paper by the clerk, so we shall go straight to questions from the committee. And uh, I don't believe any of you have been to the Finance Committee recently, so um, what I shall do is I shall uh, start basically uh, with a few questions and then we'll open up the session to colleagues uh, round the table. Okay, so the first question basically is, uh, in terms of um, Section 27 of the Social Work Scotland Act, there have been a number of concerns have been raised by COSLA and some of the local authorities who have given evidence to the committee. They have suggested that new fund, the new funding formula to allocate S27 funds has not been finalised and therefore detailed, inf detailed information about allocation of lo to local resources is not yet available and this creates a difficulty for stakeholders in trying to accurately determine what the ongoing financial impact of the bill on their organisations may be. So how do we go forward with that difficulty? And thank you. Um, there is a review going on at the moment for the, the funding formula for Section 27 and, and stakeholders will be aware of that. Um, there is a, a, an advisory group being formed to uh, look at the funding uh, mechanism and I would say that the funding mechanism is not actually relating to the bill or a change to the model it was planned anyway. Um, the Funding Technical Advisory Group has been established to oversee the work of developing a new community justice formula to replace the current model. The advisory group are due to report to the main funding group in October. Um, recommendations will then be made to joint Scottish Government and COSLA Settlement and Distribution Group. Um, if proposals are endorsed, then we should see a new funding model uh, being piloted in 2016-17. Uh, this will see a new model shadowing the old model. And uh, the new funding model would then go live in 2017-18. Uh, Mm, I, I, I'm just wondering, though, how, how um, we've got a financial memorandum, though, and there's, uh, it, it, although some of our uh, witnesses have suggested, or some of the people given as evidence have suggested, yeah, you know, for them it might work well, there are others that really do have some concerns about this particular area. I mean, it's kind of difficult to, to quantify something which has not yet been deliberated upon, is it not? What the impact will be on stakeholders, I think that's a point that's been made by COSLA and individually by others. Elaine, if I, if I may, in terms of the Section 27, it's around the £95-£96 million pounds per year, and that's for criminal justice social work to carry out their core business, court reports, supervision and so on, but also non-core work as well, uh, oft, some of which is often very innovative projects uh, and very locally based. The purpose of the model, however, is to take a far broader view of funding and resourcing for improved outcomes for community justice. So that 100 million is part of the piece and part of the puzzle. In actual fact, through the review of Section 27, it's our intention, through the shadowing arrangements next year, that local authorities will know far, far ahead than they ever have before what they're likely to get in terms of Section 27 obviously subject to the comprehensive spending review and ongoing agreement with the settlement and distribution group. But the Section 27 monies are for criminal justice social work, but they're only part of this overall puzzle, if you like, for community justice in Scotland. They're part of one of the partners, essentially. OK, I'll go through some of, some of the evidence that we've received. I have to say, my own not, uh, local authority in North Easter Council doesn't seem to have any concerns whatsoever, but not everyone uh, shares that view. I mean, COSLA have said, for example, that... Uh, the potential for the new model to develop and strengthen partnerships with local statutory and third sector partners will be immensely rewarding in terms of positive outcomes. So they, they, they are very positive about it, but they, they, they do have, for example, concerns about uh, transitional funding only being available for three years. Now, obviously, the word transitional means it can't go on forever, but what's, what's the thinking behind that? Because they obviously have concerns that after those three years, they'll be left holding the baby, so to speak. Um, 
We have had discussions with COSLA about the transitional funding. It was agreed with them. The purpose of the transitional funding is to build capacity and understanding within community justice partners and community planning partners as to their role under the new model. Um, and therefore, there's work going ahead on the, the transitions work stream supported by the transitional funding to help build that capability ahead of the new model going ahead. Um, yes, there, there is undoubtedly some stakeholders seeking for that funding to continue uh, once the new model is, is going live. And our view on that is that um, the task of planning and, and reporting for community justice is, is not new, and it's a reframing of the existing approach to planning, which is already being undertaken by um, planning partners. And therefore, our view is that let's wait and see. You know, there's transition work going on, there's transition funding being provided, and let's see what happens in the course of that. Uh, we, are, we have committed to work with COSLA together to identify any issues that arise during the transitional period. So let's see how this transitional plan works out and uh, review the position at that point. OK. Um, review the position, what does that mean? That means there could be a possibility of additional funding at, at that point? Uh, that, that, is, that is possible. There, there may also be the consequence that it's felt that no additional funding is required so uh, Scottish Government is keeping an open mind on that and we would invite our stakeholders to also keep an open mind and, and see what comes of the transition period. I mean, the difficulty I have with this FM is that you know that you've put some, some, some solid figures obviously in the financial memorandum, but then you get comments like Aberdeen should have said things like it's difficult to make an accurate assessment prior to the operational impact of the allocated resources becoming apparent. <laughs> and Angus saying there's little to suggest ongoing costs have been given due consideration. So there, are, there continues to be some concern in, t in terms of local uh, government and, and how this is going to be uh, rolled out. But the Criminal Justice Voluntary Sector Forum, to switch from local government for a minute, has said, uh, and I quote, that in terms of sustainability of service, they've said that the uncertainty in terms of funding from their perspective creates a lack of confidence among sentencers and other partners about the future availability of the service and therefore acts as a barrier to partners, one partnership working and to increasing the use of viable community alternatives to custody. And they go on to say that these um, financial um, costs may lead to the closure of some services. I could, perhaps, I could perhaps pick that up. Um, so we worked very closely with the third sector and with the forum in particular um, and its chair as we've gone through this entire model from pre-consultation right through. And one of the things they have raised, and they sit on the funding group that's looking at the Section 27 funding and broader leverage, is their issue with the year-on-year -year funding that they tend to have, which takes, is difficult, therefore, for people to look more strategically um, and a longer term in terms of services. And you could understand that. So in terms of looking at the funding model, what we're also going to be looking at is, can we start to have a longer vision around that? Um, now, obviously, it's still being discussed at this point in time, but we are starting to look to see, can we give people some indication on a principled basis, not facts and figures, but on a principled basis for the longer term funding? The other thing we're doing is that we've heard from people around commissioning and how difficult that can be and how time consuming that can be as well, multiple tenders and so on and so forth, particularly for those providers. So one of the first things that Community Justice Scotland will do when it's established is to work with all partners and stakeholders, both purchasers and providers in-house or third sector and others, including the private sector, to develop a strategic approach to commissioning and by which we mean, what are we currently delivering? How well? are those services performing in terms of an evaluation of that, including shared services? It's important to get those economies of scale in there. What are the needs going forward? Do we have the services that are actually going to deliver those needs? If not, what does the evidence say are the best services to give us those? And how are we finally going to deliver that? And will that lead to procurement exercises or indeed um, a public social partnership approach and other more creative approaches. So that's one of the first things. We've not got that at the moment for community justice. We've not got it for criminal justice social work. What we've also said is, because this is a local model, then commissioning should be around that local needs. 
And if there's any procurement, then it should take a lead authority or lead agency or use existing arrangements first and foremost before then any, say, commissioning or contracting were done through Community Justice Scotland. Okay. Yes. Speak to the specific kind of concerns from our third sector colleagues around these short-term funding cycles. One of the outcomes of this review of Section 27 funding, which you alluded to earlier on, is the potential for giving people three-year settlements. Um, for, so that will allow them to do that kind of local planning far, on a far longer-term basis than is currently the situation. One can understand the concerns about getting this year-on-year -year, um, settlement. So there is a move within the, the work outside the bill that goes in parallel to the bill to improve the way in which we fund, the way in which we look at performance ac across the piece to, to move to that kind of longer-term view, which, which I, I think will help answer those concerns that you've received from the third sector. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now, in terms of the figures, you know, um, in, in Table A of the financial memorandum, you've got a, a number of um, cost categories and a number of estimates. And what I found interesting was that, for example, in, in terms of the ongoing annual running costs for Community Justice Scotland, it seems to be a very precise figure at 2.209 million, and the Community Justice Authority 7's liability, you've got very precise figures, £248,094 is £744,000. £284, so that's the kind of uh, the minimum and maximum, very uh, precise, and obviously I imagine it will be somewhere within there. But the rest of the figures, uh, when I see rounded figures, I see they always look ballpark to me. And only um, uh, late yesterday, early today, we got um, a wee letter, actually, um, from Paul Wheelhouse, um, uh, the minister basically commenting on the, the issue with relation to the pension liability which is the estimated shortfall of 2.5 million. And then it talks about the estimate should perhaps be 4.5 million pounds. I mean, it's quite a difference. I mean, that's a two million pound difference, you know. Uh, can you talk us through some of these um, rounded figures, so to speak? Sure. Um, I took that one. Yes, I mean, there is a certain amount of rounding up going on um, with the figures just for, 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 for neatness and, and, and ease of, of understanding. But, but I would have understood that if they would all been rounded up. But some have been rounded up and some haven't. That's why I'm, I was asking yeah. specifically why that would be the case. OK. Um, I mean, yes, maybe we should have rounded up the severance liability just for, for uniformity. Um, but I can assure you the figures have been... Where they've been rounded, they have been rounded up and not rounded down. Um, with regard to the question you're asking about the pension uh, and the discrepancy um, of £2 million, um, when the financial memorandum was, was drafted, um, we used the existing triennial valuation of pension liability uh, dating from March 2014. Um, we consulted with the UK Government's Actuary Department and they confirmed that that was the best estimate that, that we could use at that time. So, so that is what we did. Now, that triennial valuation was based on the Community Justice Authority's remaining an employing authority for, for pension purposes. Um, what we have here with the higher figure is a recalculation um, based on what is projected at 2017. Obviously, the next triennial valuation is due in 2017. We've asked for it to be done now. Um, and... The key difference this time is that the community justice authorities are being treated as um, as ceasing as at 31st of March 2017. Now, that does have a considerable impact on the cessation value for the fund um, because, because they're no longer uh, an employing authority. They can no longer contribute to the fund and therefore any shortfall um, has to be drawn from them at that point on the 31st of March 2017. And if I can just put it in plain terms, once the community justice authorities are disbanded, there's no, um, no means of the pension fund being able to call on them again for any shortfall. Therefore, the actuaries are looking long term and as they do when it comes to long term forecasting, uh, they are making quite a big provision for the risk attached um, to these uh, pension figures. And that, that explains the, the increase in the figure from two and a half to potentially four and a half million pounds. 
Mary yeah. Eliza, it's a kind of guesstimate, but we're talking about quite a big difference. I mean, talking yes. about almost doubling of the initial Absolutely, estimate. yes, yes. The thing that's changed between when the financial memorandum was provided and submitted to the Parliament and now is the availability of this um, more accurate um, assessment. So, so that's, and indeed the financial memorandum made the point that it was likely um, to be an underestimate and we'd be looking to update that at, at, at stage one. Um, but, you know, we are in sort of difficult territory with making these kind of estimates and um, the, the 4.5 is, is the best we, we've got now, but even that remains subject to some uncertainty um, come the actual point of disestablishment as well. Um, I suppose you know, another point, if I may, around you, you, the, the point you make being around the roundings ups. I mean, some of these are round figures, but they are absolutely the accurate figures. So, for example... 1.6 million. I mean, that's obviously the 50,000. Exactly. And I realise that, but th that was the point I was going to make. Some of the others. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> OK, thank you for that. Uh, I'm now going to open up the session to colleagues around the table. And the first person to ask questions will be joined to be followed by Gavin. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, we have touched on quite a lot of areas already. Uh, one of the points in the COSLA contribution that struck me was that um, they said that when the, the police and the fire went in from the eight bodies into one, that uh, local authorities received funding to compensate them for the additional costs associated with carrying out their local scrutiny functions. So they're kind of drawing a parallel there. And, I mean, it would have seemed to me there might be extra work involved for local authorities in, in that realm. Is, is that the case? Yeah, the... Um COSLA have mentioned this to us also, we are, we are aware of this, but the, the reconfiguration of the police force is a very different change process to what is being envisaged for the community justice authorities. It is not a like-for-like -like comparison, um, and, and that would be a response to that. Because, I mean, it affects the voluntary sector, as, I guess, as well, that uh, they're, instead of relating to eight bodies, some of them, I don't know, uh, an SPCC, for example, instead of related to eight bodies, they're going to relate to 32 bodies. That, that surely has to be a resource implication somewhere. Yes, we, we are aware of this, and we have discussed it with the third sector, and you know, we, we fully appreciate the, the point that they are putting across. Um, as well as transition monies being made available to community planning partners, we are also making available £50,000 to the Community Justice, uh, sorry, Criminal Justice Voluntary Sector Forum, to assist them in the transitional period. And uh, as part of the overall transition work programme, we are bringing forward these very issues in the hopes that they will work together to identify a process which can streamline this so that they are not facing a, a burden of having to bid 32 times over. OK, thank you. Gavin. Thank you. Um, OK, the... You're giving 1.6 million per annum transition funding uh, to help smooth the transition, um, but as it stands, there's no additional money um, per annum for the community planning partnerships. Now, you've said you're in discussions with them, you'll follow progress and so on, um, and in response to the convener, you said that could result in more funding, or equally, it could not result in more funding. Is it therefore the Scottish Government's view, as we sit now, that you don't, you can't foresee any additional funding being required after the transitional period for um, local planning partnerships. Yes, that, that is the, that is our position at the moment. Yes, um, but as I've said, we are uh, working together with COSLA and we are monitoring the transition period. And you know, I think it's for everyone involved to keep an open mind and to review positions as necessary as we go forward. Okay. Um, reading the COSLA submission, I mean, they're, they're quite supportive of the proposal as a whole, um, and you do appear to have worked with them on a number of areas, but they do sort of, they put forward the view anyway that little attempt uh, has been made to capture resource implications of delivering the new structure locally. Um, is that a fair comment or is that something the government would dispute? I think it's probably a mixed comment. Um, and it, it may be a comment to us, but it may also be a comment to the local partners as well. Um, in fa actual fact, we funded a post within COSLA to lead the transition work stream. And one of the things the transition work stream within this work will do is to manage that change process and to understand how partners are progressing on the ground and whether or not additional resource will be required. We've had some local authorities who have said actually the partners together would absorb this because it's about them coming together to say 
how can we improve outcomes, rather than putting it all on the head of this person over here, for example. We've had other partners who have said, we're going to absorb the costs, we don't see any additional costs for us at all. So it is a very mixed picture. So through that transition work stream, we will get a clearer understanding. The, there are reports on the transitional funding. So for the, that, for this year, the reports are due in May of 2016. What did you do with the funding? How is the change progressing? What's your next steps? We're also expecting the transition plans for 1617 to come in in January of next year, and they will set out again how will you use the funding and how is the change progressing and what about the future arrangements? What will be your local arrangements? And we'd expect within that for them to say how are they going to resource those local arrangements as well. Okay. So that, if I may, is the um, provision of that 1.6 million transition funding was the direct result of the consultation we had with a range of partners over, over that period. They made the case to us that it'd be useful to resource that period, and we were able to make that case to ministers um, for that three-year period as well. And, and indeed, COSLA made that point, and we're quite positive about it in, in their submission. Um, what they have said, though, is that they, in, in their view, the successful delivery of the performance framework is likely to cost each community planning partnership £100,000 per annum. Um, now, they don't see too much more. They give a bit of breakdown in terms of number of staff they thought would be required. But, I mean, what, what's your response to, to that statement by them that it, it's going to cost £100,000 per annum? I think we'd probably welcome a bit more information around that as well. And, and just looking at one of the other submissions you see from Perth and Kinross, they put a £45,000 um, figure on it. So, And as Ali mentioned, we're in touch with other local authorities who think they can absorb it altogether. So um, I'll probably go back to some of the other comments you made about the, the purpose of transition and the arrangements we put in place to monitor that, is that we can be open-minded at the end of that period to make sure that we're understanding it properly. Because what we wouldn't want to do is find ourselves in a situation where we are under-resourcing it in a way that prevents the new model from achieving um, its potential. But I think initial reaction to that 100,000 seems on the high side um, for what we envisage to be the sorts of activities that may or may not be, be taken on. Indeed, there does seem to be a spectrum within local authorities around what, if any, they might need um, in addition to that. OK, but the, the government view is that some, some local authorities have said to you specifically, we can absorb all of that cost, so, that, so the net cost to us, we know. But, but some, I mean, to be fair, some have said to you in your view that, that there will be a cost, but your view is 100,000 is on the, the high That's side. That's right, and I mean, and I think we probably have a responsibility to be sceptical about that and, and look at what's going on to make sure um, that we are resourcing it appropriately. Um, and, you know, looking at the way the model is intended to work, where it's putting responsibility on the local partners to work together, it's not unreasonable for us to be able to expect that sort of partnership working to be done as part of everyday work and the course of the way local health board works with criminal justice social work and so on. So, yes, we it is our responsibility to identify what, if any, additional um, is to that, and the transition period allows us to do that. Okay, and, I mean, this may be more a question for the minister as opposed to the bill team, but, I mean, if... Let, let's assume this transition continues and you, you engage with COSLA and so on, but you then reach the view as a, as a team that actually some additional funding is required here. It, is there a commitment from government to your knowledge that that funding will definitely flow if it can be demonstrated that it's required? Well, I think the commitment the, the Minister's given in, in conversations with, with people who he's spoken to around it is they'll be absolutely open-minded about that. Um, and... You know, I suppose I go back to the earlier comment that if this becomes one of the things on which the, the ability for the new model to achieve everything it wanted to be, becomes a, a key issue, then clearly we'd need to um, think very, very hard about making sure that we are, we are supporting it um, to achieve everything that we expect it to, to, to achieve. OK, I won't ask you to go further because obviously that is a one for the Minister to, to, to answer more directly, should it be put. OK, in, I mean, in terms of the... You've outlined... Um, as the convener said, in, in a reasonably detailed way, the, the set-up costs and the annual running costs of Community Justice Scotland. Um, in terms of the annual running costs, 2.2 million or uh, thereabouts, um, how, does that, how does that compare broadly to the annual running costs if, uh, for the totality of the eight uh, Community Justice Authorities? I mean, I think you've said it's difficult to do a direct comparison, but you, you, must, you must want to do a ballpark comparison. I mean, this isn't completely 2.2 million of additional spend there must be some saving I mean have you done any analysis on that um, basically the the cost of the, the present model is around 2.74 million pounds 
Um, and as you've said, uh, we need to be slightly cautious about making comparisons because it's not a like-for-like -like, um, comparison here. Okay, so I, mean, I, I accept that entirely, but, but your, your view anyway on the analysis you've done is that it's not costing us an extra 2.2 million a year. If anything, it, it's saving us you know, half, a, half a million or thereabouts. Okay. Um, last, last area then is just the, the disestablishment of the uh, community justice authorities. Um, we've, we've covered pension costs, so I'll skip that question. In terms of severance costs, I mean, there's quite a broad range there, ranging between sort of quarter of a million and three quarters uh, of a million in terms of the severance costs. Can you just outline, I mean, that's quite a, you know, although it's a difference uh, in, in cash terms isn't huge, in terms of percentage terms, that's quite a big spread. Can you just outline why there's quite a big spread? Um, the, the upper, when you're dealing with uncertainties, it, it's best to provide a range of figures. So the upper range uh, makes an assumption that all staff, all community justice authority staff, remain in post as at 31st of March 2017. The, the lower end assumes that a third remain in post as at 31st of March 2017. And it's a simple arithmetical third, you know, um, so that's, that's how we've worked it out. Obviously, we don't know what the reality is going to be, and therefore that, that's our best estimate at the present time, and as I say, giving a range of values in, in light of the uncertainty. OK, no, that, uh, I understand that. If, I mean, so you have a, a normal turnover of staff, I guess, like, like any organisation. If, if somebody leaves one of those authorities now, then, is, is the position that they won't be replaced and therefore that brings down that figure or will they be replaced and their redundancy is lower because they've been there a shorter period of time? What, what's happening on the ground? Ground, then clearly the CGAs know that they will be disestablishment and that the employment will come to an end at, at a certain date. So as you can imagine, staff there are looking for other jobs and there'll be other opportunities that come up as a result of um, th this new model. So um, I suppose without going into sort of details of each sort of individual, we know that a number of people have um, left and moved on to, to different jobs and then a decision is taken about replacing them, but where that decision has been to replace, they'd be put on a fixed term contract, so there would then be no severance liability at the end of it. So um, I think already that upper figure probably has come down a little bit because some of the, the, the stuff we calculated have moved on to, to other jobs as we go. OK. Let's say, for the sake of argument, I'll pluck a number out there, there are 10 people left employed by the CGAs come uh, 2017. What happens then? I mean, they, are they, are they, do they have to take compulsory redundancy? Well, there will be a severance package, but clearly their employment... Is their employer is no longer there, so there will be a, a package of, afforded to them. So um, what we'd hope to get into position is that the only people who are left in that situation are those that want um, to be there, um, effectively. Um, so they've made that sort of decision. What we're trying to look to do over the period of this period of the period of the transition is to allow people to move on to other posts um, elsewhere in the sector, or, or, or indeed, you know, a, a different sector um, altogether. Um, in terms of taking your figure of sort of 10, what that cost would then be, it will depend very much on their salary, the length of service, and, and so on to, to, calculate, um, to calculate that. OK. And just lastly then, you, you haven't decided where the premises are yet, but I mean, has, has the decision been made, or at least are you publicly allowed to say, where is, the, where is Community Justice Scotland going to be located? Do you, have you chosen a town or city or a region, or is, is, could it literally be anywhere at this stage? What's the... It's not yet been chosen. Sure. Uh, we are working with the states and others around that, and we've also got to do the assessment. One of the key things that came back from the consultation was that it needs to be accessible by public transport. The other thing that came back was, um, this is Community Justice Scotland, so could people be home-based as well? So particularly people maybe working in the hub on learning and development activities where they'd be going out and about and speaking and uh, delivering uh, training to people on the ground anyway across Scotland. And we've said that makes sense. That makes sense. So we'd be encouraging that. Obviously, those sorts of policies would be up to the chief executive to set when they come in. But that's what we'd be encouraging, that people could be home-based because it is community justice Scotland. Um, but we are undertaking a location assessment at the moment, working with our state's colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, thank okay, you. thank you very much. Yeah, there appear to be no further questions from committee, but I've got one or two just uh, to round things up, actually. 
Um, in terms of the appointment of the Community Justice Scotland members, um, it says in the financial memorandum that there will be no fewer than five and no more than eight non-executive members. Uh, it says that in paragraph 16. But in paragraph 24, talk about the members' uh, costs. And it's just, say, members at £14,904, two days per month for six months. I assume, uh, well, that seems to, that 14904 is very precise. So, how many members are you going to have? Because it's been five and eight. I'd have thought there would have been a ballpark figure there. And the two days per month, I take that's for all the members, not each member. Otherwise, it would give them £1,250 a day, which seems to me quite extravagant. Um, no, it would be two days per month for each member. Um, in terms of how many members? Sorry, I'm just trying to. Aye, but the figure is yeah. very precise. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, five to eight. I mean, that is that's the the range that, that we've set, and obviously, the Scottish ministers will decide how many to appoint. Um, and likewise, the, the appointments are likely to be staggered because they will serve three years, and obviously, we don't want everyone beginning and ending at the same time. So there is some, you know, um, uncertainty as to exactly how member how many members there will be. I'm just trying to find very quickly. Um, 24, it says members at 14,904. I just wonder if there's, a, if there's between five and eight members, how would you be able to come up with a figure like that? Surely it would be a well, figure, we, we, a ballpark figure for yeah. that one. Between we've, we've, um, we've made a decision as to what it, you know, we've just, for example, maybe decided it was based on six members at two days per month. I'm sorry, I can't find that right we away. We can check that for you. Okay. Check that, 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 My understanding is it's the upper it. end. Yeah. It's the yeah, upper end we've used. But we'll check that and we'll come back to you. The other thing I was going to ask you was, we've talked a lot about the 1.6 million per annum divided among 32 local authorities. I'm just wondering why it was decided to give 50,000 to each local authority, given that there's a difference in scale quite significantly between Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles at one end and Glasgow and Edinburgh and the other. So why was it decided to, to make it a straight 50,000 rather than have a balance between a set amount plus maybe a bit more? Because one would have thought the workload would be significantly higher in some areas rather than others. There were two different options um, put forward. One was the straight £50,000 split amongst all. And that was in recognition of the fact that, yes, there's different population sizes, but actually there's also, in some of the smaller population sizes, far larger geographic size. So um, that's a little bit of uh, swings and roundabouts. Um, they're still very saying, similar. Highlands has got significantly more people and a lot more geographically spread than Clark Manninshire, for example. That's true. That's true. So, that's true. But we're still dealing with the same number of partners. So you're still dealing with a health board and a local authority in Police Scotland. So the actual activity about building that capacity and capability at a partner level is similar. The other option uh, was put forward, did take into account um, size um, and workloads as well. So it was more of a range. The, both options were put forward to the Joint Causeless and Scottish Government Settlement and Distribution Group um, and they made a recommendation which up, went up to Causal Leaders and it was Causal Leaders who decided that it would be the £50,000 split. That's fine. Thank, thank you. I'm not convinced by the logic of that, but never mind if that's what has been decided, I suppose. And just one final uh, issue, paragraphs 12 and 13 of the causal submission, uh, they've said that, and I quote, the building of supporting documents pays little attention to resourcing the development of the new model locally. And then they go on to say uh, local partnerships will receive no additional funds, and that doesn't seem to support the policy intention to shift to a local model. So what's, uh, what's, why is that? Sorry, I didn't quite catch what you were Sorry, saying paragraphs the 12 and 13 of the causes of submission, they say, and I quote, the bill and its supporting documents pay little attention to resourcing the development of the <coughs> new model locally, and they go on to say local partnerships will receive no additional funds, which doesn't seem to support the policy intention to shift to a local model. So effectively, you know, what they're basically saying is that what, what you want to do with the bill is not being effectively supported through the financial memorandum. I think this. I think this is going back to the, the previous point you were saying about transitional funding being continued um, into future years. Um, and yes, we're aware that, that COSLA do have concerns about resourcing uh, local partnerships, which I think we've we've already said um, we will keep under review together with our stakeholders during the, the transition period, uh, and also bearing in mind that there are other views which disagree with the COSLA point of view. 
Um, sorry, was there some other aspect you feel we haven't covered? No, that was it. Basically, it's yeah. just their view that, you know, that they, I mean, because I've made it quite clear, as uh, both myself and indeed Gavin pointed out, that they are very supportive of what they're doing. And I, I made a, an earlier quote exactly which said that. Um, but they, they do have, I was just trying to cover those concerns that they said about, you know, it's one thing to be supportive of what you're doing, but is the funding going to be there to ensure it's actually delivered on the ground is a key issue for us, I suppose. In terms of this, the, the global funding figure, go back to the, the Section 27 money where, where you start to convene around that £100 million. So looking at that in the context of you know the £1.6 million we're, we're giving here, where there's still a huge amount of money going out to support local authorities around that. Clearly we, and indeed colleagues at COSLA, want to make the absolute best use um, of that money. But as we spoke in previous about tradition, we, we're absolutely open-minded around you know what additional might be required um, in the future, but um, we think it's best just to see what happens over this transitional period, see what the evidence shows us before um, finalising what, what the position should be. Yes, and I notice in paragraph 11 you've said there'll be no overall reduction in the level of funds currently provided by the Scottish Government for community justice, so I do think that's an important point. Okay, well, thank you very much for your evidence today. I really appreciate the answering of our questions. Is there anything further you want to say before we wind up the session? I think we will come back to you on that calculation that you asked for about, you know, Shah working out about how we got to um, precise figure and, you know, the, the numbers that that was um, calculated on to, to okay, that would be that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, at the start of the meeting, the committee agreed to take the next item in private. I therefore would like to close the public part of the meeting and just have a couple of minutes recess to allow our witnesses and public to leave.